Welcome, Scoop World Order. It is a special Saturday night show. Uh, some big stuff popping off. Lorenzo Salles Jr., uh, Jordan Lytle, uh, surprise commitment tonight. NFL draft just ended. Uh, some Buckeyes slipped a little bit. Got to talk about all that. Take your questions. Uh, break down some film. Uh, so we're going to get into this thing because there's a lot of stuff to cover. And uh, we only got about an hour to go. So appreciate you guys as always. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Leave us a like. Shout out where you're from in the comments. Those really help spike the video. So we appreciate you guys doing that. It's fun seeing where you guys are from. Also, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. That's so huge for us. And if you enjoy these live shows, click the bell. Get the alert when we go live. You'll never miss a show. Again, we love the feedback. We love the question and answer. Um, but yeah, we're going to get right into this thing because uh, what a red hot show. So I'm bringing in Nevada Buck Nevada. Lorenzo Styles, uh, we had that a week ago, is now officially an Ohio State Buckeye, committed to Ryan Day today, um, announced it a short while ago, uh, and also we got a very uh, surprise commitment from a guy that I think is extremely underrated, Jordan Lyle. I talked to some of our South Florida Ex Express friends down there. They say he's a superstar, um, so I put more credence into that than anything. They say this kid is super legit. He's from St. Thomas Aquinas, home of Joey Bosa and Nick Bosa. So really prolific school, one of the best colleges, or excuse me, high schools in all of the country, uh, just a powerhouse. Uh, but your thoughts on this kind of this Saturday bonanza, I thought we were going to be talking about the NFL draft and it's turned into a really nice site for of recruiting gets for, for Ohio State. Well, first of all, yeah, great day for Ohio State. Great day. If you're a gambler, we just hit our big hammer bet on UFC tonight. So, uh, if, if you're not on Buckeye Scoop, and you're, you should just subscribe just to get the bets because we just literally loaded the chamber on one, one of big bets, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, Ohio State has kind of hit the jackpot as well. Uh, Tony Alford has been criticized, and I've been one of the ones that's criticized him for you know what I would consider recruiting sometimes that has been substandard and you know missing, uh, not bringing in running backs in, not anticipating – uh, you know, moves or NIL difficulties with running backs, but you got to give them credit when, when I like to give guys credit when it's due. And this is a big day for Tony Alford because this is a big get. This is a, this is a really, really good player. Now you always are a little skeptical hippo about these, these Florida kids. And can you keep them to the, until signing day? Yeah. Uh, but my information is that this is, this is that kind of kid and that this is, you know, this one should go, you know, to the good guys in the right column. And this isn't just an opening bid. So, uh, you know, good day for the Buckeyes. Obviously, the uh, Lorenzo Styles Jr., you know, information we've had for a while. So I think we spoil you guys by breaking it before it happens. But <laughs> excited about that one as well. So uh, good news abounding for uh, Ohio State fans. Just a, just a great day. And, you know, the uh, the draft was a little a little disappointing in terms of where some of the guys went. But just the, the fact that they all they all went, they got drafted, they're doing their thing. And I think they're all in great spots. The fact that the Browns took back-to-back -to -back offense time to DeWan and Luke Whipler just makes it great. It just shows me that the Browns are changing, that maybe there is a new day for the Browns. Because the Browns went years between, I think, you know, they went, like, from Craig Powell all the way to Denzel Ward. They went, like, 25 years without drafting a Buckeye. And now they draft a Buckeye lineman back-to-back. -back. So, uh, great day all the way around and very, very excited. They also signed Ronnie Hickman as an undrafted free agent and Tanner McAllister as an undrafted free agent as the roster is stretched to 90. So they added four Browns today, which, or excuse me, four Buckeyes to the Browns today. So, hey, it's better than nothing because that's what it was for about 20 straight years, like you mentioned. Um, I'm going to get into this film. Uh, Nevada, how shocked were you when when this popped tonight? I mean, I, I didn't see this one coming at all. I don't think anybody did. I mean, nobody, this isn't one where everybody had the edits done and the, interviews taped like there's no taped commitment interview with this kid um how surprised when you saw this come across the wire i was surprised and I, i'm not surprised by a lot and i'm talking about surprise in terms of like really not seeing it at all normally you've heard something you've picked oh, up yeah. something it's been but yeah but this one for me was uh, completely surprising and uh you know, this is a pleasant one because this is a terrific kid. And the, the funny thing is, like I said, as soon as I started reaching out to my South Florida people, they're like, man, this is a good kid for the Buckeyes. This is a really solid kid. So as you mentioned, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas kid. And uh, they think he's solid to the Buckeyes. I think he'll be solid all the way to the finish line, which makes it been that much more excited. But I, this is a good one. Yeah, it's interesting because we just took um... – Obviously, James Peoples is kind of the bell cow. Sam Williams Dixon's the local kid that we just took. So now we have three running backs committed. 
Um, be interesting to see if if they all stick or how that works out. Honestly, I don't care because we, you know, this room is is real top heavy. And after this year, you're losing Trey, you're losing Mayan. There could be a transfer. So I mean, there's gonna be a lot of room at the end after this season. But I love the film. I love the bursts. I love. I love seeing these uniforms because like St. Thomas Aquinas Raiders. I mean, the, the, it's like, I remember watching Joey, uh, his senior year when Nikki was a freshman, they played, I think they played Don Bosco or one of those. It was like one of those ESPN nationally televised games. And like Nikki was like dominant as a freshman and Joey was, he was a monster, but like, I couldn't believe how good Nikki was as a, as a little, uh, a little freshman. They're playing like nose guard. It was hilarious. But I think, um, you know, when you get kids from programs like this, you know they're all coached. You, I mean, you can just watch their their schematics, and you can tell by the blocking and by the technical stuff that these guys are very well coached, and they're very good, and they play very high level football. So I'm excited. I mean, because he's running over some really good teams here. Uh, these guys go deep in the playoffs. These guys have won the state championship a ton in Florida. So um, this is really big, big boy football. There is I see I, these are my favorite when they show these guys dropping the shoulder here. He doesn't try to sidestep him, lowers the boom on the guy, punishes the guy, kind of flips him over. So I love that. Like I said, it's going to be interesting to see how they manage the recruits going forward. I think that in modern times with college football, I think kids are a lot more apt to come with another star back because they're all very cognizant of not of the wear and tear aspect of college football. And nobody wants to be like the super bell cow anymore. Nobody wants to be the guy that gets 30 carries and gets beat to – crap before they hit the league um you know they want to have some tread left on the tires and i think that that's something that um it's just a it's just a sign of the times now these guys they like to have a, a running mate to go with them and and i think these guys are good compliments for each other but i'm just i'm excited about the kid like i said it was it's kind of out of the blue um like i said i talked to my guy in south florida he's like he was shocked he's like oh he committed i was like yeah you, you didn't know and he's like no I, we heard rumors but you know, Alabama offered this kid. I mean, this guy's got real offers. He's got Bama, Penn State. Um, I'm not sure if he had Georgia, uh, Auburn, Florida. He had all the Florida schools, obviously. But you know, when you beat Bama any time, it's a it's a cause for celebration. And you know, this kid's got wheels, man. Like I said, it's it's a good day. It's good for Tony Alford to have. I mean, last year we didn't have any. We lost uh, our boy Fletcher at the at the final whistle to Miami because of an NIL deal. But you know, getting three in the in the bag early is, I guess, good. You know, I mean, we haven't even hit summer camp season yet. We've got three committed running backs, so I don't know if that's ever happened in the history of Ohio State. And if anybody knows of a time we've had three running backs committed, please put that in the chat because I don't think I've ever seen that before. But um, I'm good with it. Whatever it takes to get to get this uh, this room restocked, because like I said, there's going to be a big transition when we lose. Trade's going to go pro. Mine's going to be going pro. Um, there's gonna be a lot of room at the end. So, but yeah, what do you think so far? We've watched about five minutes of film so far. What do you think of his film so far, Nevada? Well, you know, I, I'd, I'd seen him before and, you know, I, I, it was funny because when I'd seen it before, I was thinking, wow, you know, this, he's, this kid looks good, but you know, he it, will it, look more older than Ohio state, but no, he's, I mean, he's got terrific balance. He's got terrific burst, uh, catches the ball. Well, out of the backfield, which I really like. I always like those guys that are those, those hand catchers out of the backfield. And, he, you know, this level of competition is super high. So he's not playing against little kids in Missouri or South Dakota or something like that. So, no, I mean, there's lots to like about him. He's everything you want in a running back. And, you know, he, he's just, you know, he's tall. He's angular. He kind of gets the, gets the leverage really go, good going on there. And he, he'll run inside or outside. And I like that as well because you need to be able to do that in the Big Ten. And he looks like a guy that – uh that, you know, I mean, to me, he looks like Eddie George and running back back there. But, um, or, you know, I, I guess you could pick any one of you could call him Zeke, you call him Eddie or whatever. But uh, I really like him. I really like the way he runs, and I think he's going to look great uh, in Scarlet and Gray. I think he looks like Zeke, honestly. I mean, because he, because Zeke, you know, especially early in his career, he was really physical. He was fast. He wasn't scared to drop the shoulder. Could catch the ball again. I love running backs that can catch the ball in the backfield. I think it's. It's just something that we don't really do enough at Ohio State. Our receivers are so they get so open and they're so prolific. But I think it's just so hard to defend in modern football when you have a guy that can catch the ball in space. But I think he looks like Zeke. Like he looks like 2013, 2014 Zeke. The way he runs, the way he he runs forward, the way he bends. I mean, 
I don't know. Maybe it's just the 21 in the blue and it looks like the Cowboys Zeke, but I mean, he, he runs hard, you know, and, and I love guys that run hard. They're not scared. Um, and again, he runs away from guys too, but like, this looks like Zeke, you know, catching out of the backfield again, it just, um, it feels like that. I don't know if he's as explosive as Zeke. Like, again, I don't know his track times. Like Ezekiel is an unbelievable hurdler in high school, but yeah, I, I love watching this kid's tape. It's, uh, it's been good. Yeah, I had, I had a, a linebacker ready to break down and some other stuff to break down. But, you know, we get him in the fold. Uh, Low Styles jumps in the boat, which we had a week ago. Um, welcome to the, the squad, Low Styles Jr. Uh, so it's a good night for the Buckeyes tonight. It'd be interesting to see, um, you know, some of these visits are wrapping up with the portal kids. Uh, obviously, they have the, the tackle in from San Diego State. They've got Tylon Malone from Ole Miss. Um, obviously, Low Styles committed. So, uh, I think that they're all kind of in different little silos because of their travel schedules. So obviously Lorenzo Salles Jr. is from Pickerington, so it's a little different than being from uh, San Diego or being from Mississippi. As in, you know, they they probably just showed up for a day, ate a couple steaks, and went home, and that was that. So, but yeah, I, like I said, this is a, this is a good get. And again, I I love the South Florida thing because you know you know Ennis and JJ they all know these they all know each other and. You know, they don't, he doesn't play for South Florida Express just because he's a uh, he's a tailback and they don't really take running backs. But this is see this is good. I love when they put the clips of the guys blocking. So again, okay, this cements the Zeke comparison because this is some stuff we used to do with Zeke back when we used to run the quarterback more. But this is uh this is impressive because it's it's not just it's not the fact that we're ever going to run the quarterback the way that we did with 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 Urban. But you know you can see if a guy's selfless by how he blocks. You know because a lot of these guys they're allergic to blocking. And this is, again, this is why St. Thomas is one of the best programs in the country because they put clips of him pass blocking on the on the highlight film. So, again, this is something, you know, you got a, a linebacker mugged up in the B gap and you just got to see how physical is the guy. Is he going to get steamrolled? And, like, literally, this technique is flawless. I mean, rolls his hips, he's low, and he just stops the guy. So, I mean, that's something that you're Tony Alford. Like, you love that because he's not, he's not starting from ground zero as a pass blocker, which is great. Um, yeah, and this is you know, a little quick run block, um, a two tailback set. And, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just, I love when you see some of the selfless stuff uh, instead of just being touchdown run after touchdown run, like you're, you know, he's, he's lead blocking here, which again, you don't see this very often from a guy who's an Alabama, Ohio state type offer. But when you see this, this lead play and you see him flat at defensive end, or uh, this might be a linebacker. It looks like it's a three, four, like it looks like a three. Yeah, this is an outside linebacker, but, you know, it's still probably a bigger guy than him. And he puts him right in the dirt, which is great. Again, that's just something that, you know, it, it proves he's selfless. He's a tough guy. Um, again, another clip of him pass blocking. So I love it. Again, I, I, I stick to the Zeke comparison. I don't know if he's as, as top end fast as Zeke, but he's got Zeke's mentality, which is probably even more important than just your top end speed with his physicality and his pass blocking. So Zeke was a tremendous blocker. Tremendous pass walker and tremendous. I mean, again, it's a different era with the, we don't run the quarterback as much, but we used to run the quarterback lead with Zeke out front and he'd kill guys. So, uh, really good stuff. I'm excited about that. So, um, we, we've talked about Lorenzo Salas Jr. a lot. I, I'm excited to see what he can bring at corner. I think it, it'll, it, it invigorates Sonny a little bit to have his brother there. I think it's cool to have the family all together now. So, congratulations to the Styles crew. That'll be great. Uh, let's get into the draft a little bit, Nevada, Nevada. What were your takes from today? You know, obviously, you know, Dewan slipped, Luke Whipler slipped, uh, Ronnie declared early and was not drafted. Um, what are your takes from the three days that we've watched, uh, with Ohio state and the NFL draft in general? What I, what I think fans have to remember is that for some kids, you know, like I, I'll see a post and I'll be like, oh, this kid made a mistake by going this. And it's like some kids just want to go. They just want to go and they're just yeah. ready to go. And for whatever reason, they just don't want to be in college anymore. So I think people are maybe they're looking at these things the wrong way. They're looking at it through their own lens or through the lens of as a fan of Ohio State football. But for some of these kids, like a Luke Whipler, he was ready to go halfway through the year. You and I had both heard he's leaving. And, um, you know, there, you know, I think whether he was drafted in the third round or the fourth round or the sixth round, he, you know, it, it didn't really matter to him. He was going to go, he believes in himself. He's believes he's going to get, you know, get a, uh, get a job, earn a job on a roster, keep a job, get a second contract, make money and do his thing. But he was just ready to move on. And, you know, I, you know, I, I do, you know, I don't want to dwell on this, but I do want to talk about this a little bit. 
this is seven offensive linemen drafted from Ohio State in the past three years. Unprecedented. And we've talked about this, but again, I, I want to, you know, part of our objectives in these podcasts is to make people smarter, a little bit more uh, uh, clear thinking as fans so that you guys can understand what's going on. On the offensive line, you don't play a lot of guys. And what our question marks on the offensive line right now are not question marks of talent. They're question marks of experience and game time because you only play five or six guys a season, maybe seven. And right now, when three guys go early off the thing, you, you're basically left with a room of guys that, although they're highly regarded, I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, the, you know Fitzpatrick, and Tegra, and Zen. I mean, Zen was a top 300 guy. Fitzpatrick was a top 200 guy. Tegra was a top 100 guy. All high four stars. But they just haven't played yet. So we just haven't seen them. So while we have questions about the offensive line, it's not that we have, like, this huge, open, oh, we have no talent on the offensive line. We just haven't seen them play yet. So everybody just needs to take a chill pill and relax and kind of step back and see what's going to happen in terms of what's going to go on, and we're going to be fine. It's, this, this is not DEFCON 3. But the reason that we're even in this situation at all is because you had three guys declare early to go to the draft. And people say, oh, that was so easy to anticipate. No, nobody could have ever anticipated that because it's never happened in the history of Ohio State football. It's never happened in the history of any team at college football to have three guys go early off the offensive line. So I just think for Ohio State fans – Think of the, the challenges that we have on the offensive line to be ones of experience, not that we don't have talented guys in the room, not that we're not going to be able to field a capable offensive line in the fall. But I just I think that nothing could be further from the truth. So a- end of rant. Yeah, I, I agree. Like I said, I, I'm a lot more worried about our secondary. I mean, we you know, we had two starters that didn't even get drafted from our secondary last year. Um you know, and I know that we've, we've added some guys like David Siddig Benoson and some guys that could help us out. But, you know, like on the offensive line, do we have to improve? Of course. But can we help the guys that are young tackles? Yeah, absolutely. It's no different than we're going to have to help Kyle McCord, you know, a lot more than we helped CJ Stroud. You know, like you didn't really have to help Paris last year at all because he's such a phenomenal pass blocker. But, you know, it, you know like, like CJ Stroud didn't need as much help with, with e- easy throws and, more game management type play calls. Whereas, you know, Kyle McCord is going to need that. So, you know, Josh Fryer and if it's Zen, if it's Tigra, if it's Josh Simmons from San Diego state, if it's George Fitzpatrick, if it's Donnie Jackson, whoever the other tackle is, I mean, help the guy out. You know, again, I I've been, I've said it 8 million times. You guys are sick of me saying it. Donnie Jackson should start at left tackle, lock that side down and then put Josh at right tackle. And then, it's it just kind of solidifies everything, but for whatever reason they want to keep Donnie at left guard. I get it. He's a prototypical NFL guard. He's a six foot four and a half guy. He's a, it, literally, I, I saw him at the V Foundation, and we're literally the exact same height. But he's got great feet. He played tackle his entire career in high school. Uh, played it last year, last spring, so he can do it. Um, but it's just up to to Justin Fry if that's what he wants to do or not. But I again, I think that you know these guys will be fine. You can help these guys out with with mixing up the pass protections. You know, it's like in the National Football League when a superstar tackle blows an ACL, like they don't cancel the season. You got to put in a guy from the practice squad who's probably never played in the NFL or he's barely played or whatever, and you still got to go play the games on Sunday. So it's no different when you lose Paris Johnson and Dewan to like, you know, these, these guys are all on scholarship too. These guys all get, you know, checks just like, like Paris and Dewan did. So it's time for them to start earning them. So Again, will there be growing pains? Of course. But I'm more worried about quarterback and DB than I'd ever be about the line at this point. Um, and Because, again, I think our skill is so good that it'll 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 kind of buoy uh, the offensive line. Like, like in 04, um, when we weren't good on the O-line in the middle of the year, everything changed when we put in Troy Smith. We put in Troy Smith. We, put in, uh, we played Gonzo. We played Ted Ginmore. And magically, like, we were way better on the O-line because our skill guys were so good because they – would get open, catch the ball, and make plays. And they'd get open quicker than uh, the guys that were playing previous to them. So, you know, with Marvin and Emeka, like, nobody can cover those two. Then you have Cade, then you have Trey, then you have Mayan. You know, again, you see teams that have, like, okay offensive lines. You know, like the Cincinnati Bengals this year, like, they they went up to to Buffalo with a bunch of, 
guys that were beat up and you know they had to start Jackson Carmen at left tackle instead of uh Jonah Williams who's their first round pick through they was their franchise left tackle and and they went up there and won you know with a bunch of guys that hadn't played a lot and how are you ever going to block Buffalo in Buffalo with all the noise and you know what with good coaching and with great play calling you can get it done you know so again it's going to come down to Ryan Day and 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 uh Brian Hartline coming up with, you know, there's there are schemes where you can protect these offensive line a little bit. Not everything's created equal in pass protection. Um, you can move the pocket. You can run nakeds. You can run play action. There's a million things you can do to help these guys. Um, and there's stuff you can do to, to hurt them, you know. And again, uh, when you're playing against Indiana to start and Youngstown State and New Hampshire or whatever the third game is, like, you're not playing Georgia, Bama, and USC, like, right down – right off the, the rip, you know, so you got some time to get these guys ready. Um, and honestly, the lineups might change a little bit. You know, if guys are rotating in a little bit, if I'm Justin Fry, I'm rolling a couple of those guys in it at right tackle and maybe, you know, one of the the guard spots or whatever, just seeing what's the best mix, maybe even at center. I mean, I don't think center settled. I think Jacob James is going to come in and really fight for that job. And he could take the job from Carson Hinsman. Like, I mean, there's going to be a lot of competition. And honestly, I think that's great. I think competition you know, it keeps these guys sharp. Uh, there's no complacency because, you know, when you when you show up to camp and you're the second team left tackle behind Dewan or behind Paris, you know you have no chance of beating him out. Or you're behind Dewan, you have no chance of beating him out. But, like, when you're behind Tigra or when you're behind George Fitzpatrick or whoever's you know, playing right tackle, Zen Mikulski, you know that you better bring it. If you bring it that day, you could be bumped up to the first the first huddle. And those guys all want to be in the first huddle. I don't want to be with the twos. So, Again, I, I, I've just I've lived this. I know the offensive line better than everyone in the media combined times a thousand because I've played it, I've coached it, I've done the rotations, like I know how it works and I know what the mentality is. And honestly, like if I'm Justin Fry, I'm posting all these articles about how how terrible the tackles are, how terrible the line's gonna be, about how all these guys are recruiting misses. I'm putting those all in the O line room and showing them to these guys, like this is what everybody thinks of you guys. They all think you're gonna suck this year. So, you know, it's up to you guys not to suck. And if you have pride, you know, you'll take that seriously and personally. And if you don't, then you're just going to be, you know, a guy that hits the portal and goes off to, to Duke or, or wherever Eastern Michigan, or, you know, a place that's better suited for you than Ohio state. Uh, I've got Lorenzo Sal's juniors film running in the background, but uh, what else did you take from the NFL draft Nevada other than, you know, our, our line, a couple of our guys, I don't know. I, and I really don't know if DeWand and Luke made a mistake. I mean, DeWand was here four years and you know, I think a fifth year would have done him a, a tremendous amount but I, I just think that he he didn't do well in the process he could have done a lot better um luke i think obviously could have could have stayed and, and gone a little higher than the sixth round but uh what were your thoughts on it yeah no i just you know, like i said i think that you know, guys have got to go when they when they when they're ready and when they you know, when they feel that they're kind of you know done learning from college and a lot of the guys that i've talked to about things i've talked to a lot of them about it um, they're like, look, I'd rather just go, if I'm going to go learn and get better, I'd like rather go draw a paycheck and learn and get stronger and get better and try to do that at, at the NFL level. And, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of logic to that as well. So uh, I look at somebody like Noah Brown, Noah Brown leaves early for Ohio state. And I'm thinking that was the least NFL ready player that I've ever heard of going to the NFL. And what's he in, the, in his 10th year or whatever it is in the NFL right now. Yeah. So it's like. You know, I mean, you, you just you never really know with guys in terms of you know, who's going to make the good decision, who's going to make the bad decision. We talked ad nauseum about how Corey Lindsay, what was it, fifth round draft pick, nobody yeah. was predicting superstardom for Corey, and then no. he, you know Corey could buy the city of Manhattan Beach now and and still have money left over in his checking account. So you know, I think the uh, you you just never know with these kids, but I think these things all happen for a reason and. You know, the good news from an Ohio State fan standpoint is, you know what it's going to provide us with this year? A lot of experience. We're going to have a lot of guys that are going to get a lot of playing time right now that they wouldn't ordinarily have gotten, and we'll be uh, we'll be ready to go. And as you mentioned, the first three games of the season are, are uh, I, I, you know, never like to say cupcakes anytime you're starting a you know, Big Ten game right out of the bat, but you know, easier games. You know, by game four, you're pretty much kind of into a into the running thing. It's going to be a great challenge to be at Notre Dame. So I think the draft was was good for Iowa State. Great calling call for you know for Ryan Day for the program for anybody that was worried about our place in the college football world. Definitely not slipping. Um, you know, definitely you know hearing a lot of Buckeyes name called in the first round is always a good thing. And uh, 
you know, look, they couldn't have, they, they spent most of the draft talking about Marvin Harrison Jr. So anybody that's expecting to see him more than uh, these next 14 games for Ohio State better, uh, better rethink because he's going to go and he's going to go high next year and continue that uh, reputation of Ohio State great wide receivers in the NFL draft. Yeah, I think he'd, he'd probably been a top three pick this year, uh, top four pick. I mean, obviously the quarterbacks went one, two, three, but I can't imagine he had been below top five this year. But I, I just think with the with the guys declaring early that people view it as a miss, you know, obviously Ronnie Hickman not getting drafted, that's, you know, obviously the, the, the least desirable outcome. But I've just seen guys that come back and something happens, something goes wrong. You can't control everything. Like, you know, I, for instance, like Jim Trestle sent me this giant folder of all the notes he kept on me over the last 20 years since I was getting recruited. It was a really nice gesture, had like 50 documents and it included my NFL draft uh, advisory board grade. And like it said, you know, we, we advise you that you'd be like a fourth round pick or whatever. And I'm like, and this is 06, um, you know, so I was deciding to declare early or not. And then I just, you know, I was like, you know what? I just want to stay just because I, I think that linemen, it never hurts to stay an extra year. So I come back, I get in the best shape of my life. I have the best year of my life. I, you know, I, I played great. I went from being second team all big 10 as a junior to being first team all American as a senior captain, you know, uh, played great, great film, gave up one sack the entire year to the guy that was the number three overall pick in the draft. So, I mean, yeah, I really played a, a much higher level than I did in 06 and went to the senior bowl and hurt my knee. Like I hurt my knee. I had to get surgery on the Saturday of the Senior Bowl. I was, get, I was literally getting my knee fixed. So, you know, I wasn't counting on when I went to an All-Star game that I'd get hurt at the All-Star game. And then, you know, you go to the Combine. You can't work out. They do all these tests on your knee. Your knee's weak and not strong and arthritic and all this crap. So, you know, like I, I plan on coming back and developing, and, and I did. But then you suffer a, a pretty bad injury, and all of a sudden it's like, you sink like a rock. You, know, you go from being projected as a fourth round pick to going to the seventh round, which, you know, when you're, it's not as much about the signing bonus as is the roster security. Cause if you're a fourth round pick, the odds of you getting cut are, are pretty slim. Like you have to be pretty terrible. If you're a seventh round pick, I mean, there's, you know, like an 85% chance you're going to get cut, you know? So it's like, that's kind of where it changes. Cause you know, like DeWan, he's a fourth round pick. He's going to make the team basically no matter what. They gave him a $900,000 signing bonus. So, you know, it's more about the roster security. But I, I, you know, if I'd have left, would I have gone in the fourth? I don't know. But, it, but you know, it's not like a linear trajectory that if you come back, you lose. And another classic one is Mike Brewster. Mike Brewster was a kid that if he left as a junior, probably would have been a mid-round pick. Would have been, you know, ha you know, had a nice junior year. We beat Arkansas. Uh, he decides to stay for his senior year. And obviously Jim Trestle gets fired. We have the miserable year with like Fickle where we go six and seven. Um, I don't know. And and, and Mike, uh, I think his junior, he made first team all American. And so like he decided to say, and he, he ends up not getting drafted after starting like 50 games at Ohio state. So, you know, Norwell didn't get drafted again. It's not, it's not the end of the road if you go low or you don't get drafted, but you know, it doesn't mean if you stay that it's necessarily the correct decision. Like, you know, there's been guys like Michael Jordan who left early, um, again, people are like, oh, you should always stay, but you know, there's anything can happen if you stay. I mean, you could easily blow your knee out or something crazy could happen. So again, I, I never fault the guys for going and getting paid, especially, uh, because I think the worst thing a guy can do is think about declaring, not declare, and then wish he had declared. Cause I've seen guys that have done that and they end up just being complete cancers because they just complained that they didn't declare and, oh, I could have been a second round pick. Oh, I could have been a third round pick if I'd have left and, yeah, you know, and again, you don't need those guys around either. You'd rather those guys just clear out and and get on uh, with their lives as opposed to hanging out and 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 being cancers. Because I've been around guys, I played with guys that were cancers like that. I've coached guys that were like that. Um, there's names popping in my head. I'm not going to name them, but like I just, you know, you'd rather those guys just move on. Um, any uh, no, but Kirk, and, and lot, uh, no, but Kirk, but Kirk, along that point, you know. Let's like let's talk about Hickman for a second. Like Ronnie seemed to check out about halfway through the year and didn't play as well the second half of the season. You know what I'm saying? He was just mentally, it just seemed like he was gone. And so for a kid like that, it's probably for all best for all concern to move on. Not that he's not a terrific player, not that he couldn't help us, but you know, if you're not right, and because like you said, these stories have a couple of different endings. I think about 
you know, uh, how excited I was when Wyatt and Sean decided to come back for yeah. Ohio State. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, like, like, and that didn't work out well for those two guys. You know what I'm saying? Had those two guys left, you went there, you know, they probably would have done a lot better for themselves had they returned. So, so you know, selfishly, as a fan, I feel bad that I was so excited for them to come back and for them not that not to be a great story for them. So I just think, you know, it, it, we just always have to know that you never really know what the road's going to say. And I think when these kids decide to go and they just mentally decide that it's time for them to go, it's best just to wish them the best. They'll always be Buckeyes. And we move on and you, you always you know, look for the blessing. The blessing is that the guys behind him now get a chance to play. And uh, that just makes us more game ready for, for 2023 and beyond. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was literally, I stayed at the team hotel after that Alabama game, which was why it ended up being Wyatt's last game as a Buckeye. And, you know, he's on crutches after the game and it like breaks my heart. It's like, I love Wyatt. He's like my little brother. And like, you know, the guys out there, trying to win a national championship and suffers an injury where he can't even walk after the game. And I'm just like, Oh my God, like going into, you know, when you play the national championship, like you're the literally the last college football game. So then all of a sudden, you know, you can't do your draft prep if you get hurt in that game. So, you know, and he slipped in the draft and I mean, Sean Wade sunk like a rock in, in the draft. And again, if they would have just sat out like Micah Parsons and Jamar chase and you know, it's, it's less evaluation. They had great film from the year before, I mean, who knows? And again, that's like one of those things where you can't just kill yourself playing the what if game, but those guys cost themselves a lot. So again, it's not like some linear track where if you come back, you're magically, your stock's going to go up. You know I mean? With DeWan, I don't know. I, I mean, like maybe Kyle McCord holds the ball longer. I have no idea. But, you know, I mean, he felt like it was time to go and he went. And I mean, DeWan's been here for four years, which, you know, it's it's a little, I'm a little better with guys that have been here four years because it's they're kind of like the same year as a fourth year senior if they don't redshirt. Um, as opposed to a three and out guy, because three and out is tough, especially for a lineman. Luke Whipler was a three and out. Paris was Paris is like an all galaxy talent, though. And that kid's like a 35 year old in a 20 year old's body with his mentality and how he acts. So he's a little different. And, and Luke, Luke's Luke will be fine. Luke will do a good job for the Browns. Again, I think the, the thing I was the most excited about, honestly, is that the Browns have Bill Callahan and Bill Callahan is a world class offensive line coach. And he is a really hard dude. So, I mean, Dewan, you know, better uh, put down the spoon and put down the carbs, man, because Bill is going to be up his behind about the weight and, and making sure that he's on point because he's really good at what he does, you know, and it's not because he's lovey-dovey and Mr. Caring guy. He's, he's a tough guy, and it's like, for a guy like Dewan, that's the best thing that could ever happen to him because he's worked with Trent Williams and Morgan Moses and some really good big tackles, and I think that's going to be really beneficial. Plus, they've got Jed Wills, who's, you know, a fringe Pro Bowl guy, Conklin, you know, makes a fortune and this, you know, they just gave him an extension, but I mean, he could be gone after a year or two. So it's, it's kind of a good spot for Dewan to be because they have two veteran good tackles, you know, and, and Jedrick Wells is going to get paid after this year. He's going to make a lot of money. So, you know, I mean, dewan has got two good guys to learn from and, and an excellent line coach. So, Hey, I mean, it, it, it could have been worse. You know, I always worry about these guys when they go into the draft, where do they end up? Who's coaching them? What are the veterans like? Because that all that all adds up. Like if you're on good veterans, it's it's awesome. If you're on guys that are turds, it sucks. You know, if you're on good O line coaches, it's great for a guy like Dewan. So uh we'll take some questions um as we're going through here. What's up, Paul? I've got a lot of the regulars in here. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Like Jesse says there's some guys in the league like Taekwon Lewis, Jalen. I mean, Jalen Holmes. I think Jalen's he might not be on a team right now, but he was in the team, he was in the league last year. But there's a... Uh, yeah, like I said, you know, some of these guys, you know, you never know who made the right decision until you look back 10 years later. And like we look at Noah Brown's decision, everyone's like he should have stayed, but you know, he's he just signed with the Texans. He's, like he says, he's been like for six, seven years now, and he's made a bunch of money. So it's it's been good. And, and I think that the one thing that no one ever talks about is if you are Luke Whipler and you do end up playing starting for the Browns, like you're gonna hit your second contract when you're like 24 years old because he is a six round pick. So He's got a four-year deal and then he's out. So, you know, if you're if you're good, you're gonna get paid and you're gonna be really young, which teams look at that when they're signing free agencies. They don't want to sign guys that are overage and you're paying for past production. So if Luke and Dewan really lock it in, you know, I mean, like like Orlando Brown was was kind of a third-ish, fourth round-ish type pick for the Ravens, got paid a ton by the Bengals. Trent Brown, 
another super size tackle was a seventh round pick for the the 49ers got paid a ton by the Raiders um he's back with the Patriots now so you know if, if you put your head down for three years and you really lock in you can make a ton of money to make up for the disappointment of draft day um yeah yeah the Browns picked up Hickman and um Tanner McAllister those are so two of the uh the undrafted guys um but yeah Nevada, any other draft thoughts? Any other teams that sit out to you? I think the Steelers, it's amazing how the Steelers just kill it in the draft. I mean, they get you know really good tackle, then they get Porter Jr., and then they get the big tight end from Georgia. Uh, anything else stand out uh, for you in the uh, draft tonight? No, I just think that, look, I always say teams, and this is true for any sport, for any team, teams are not good by accident. And teams are not bad by accident. It's all it's a matter of you know, culture and what they're doing. And I just think that the Patriots and the uh, the, the uh, Steelers play the draft game as well as anybody. They just draft well, and that's why they won so many Super Bowls. And that's you know like the way that New England you know, consistently you know, trades down and uh, you know accumulates more draft capital. And then you see the dumb teams that are trading up and spending all the draft capital. Um, like I said. I thought the Steelers, I don't like the Steelers. I've always, I, I, in fact, I hated the Steelers so much during the seventies when they played the Browns. I mean, it was unnatural how much I hated the Steelers. I, I hated Jack Lambert more than you could ever hate a person that I'd never met. And, uh, <laughs> but I got to tip my hat to them. They, they, uh, they draft well. And, and I have a lot of respect for that organization and for their stability and the way that they, uh, they find their, their head coaches and support them and support them with the right type of players. So, uh, no, I just thought the draft was just another hypothesis of good teams doing good things. And, and hey, maybe the Browns are starting to become one of those good teams. Maybe if they are, they're building that new new stadium in Cleveland and they got to play a couple yeah. years in Columbus, having all those Ohio State players, not a bad idea. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't I don't know where Cam Brown went. Um, Zach Harrison to Atlanta. You know, it, I think that. Uh, you know, Zach Harrison's a guy that'll play 10 years in the league. Why is that? People are like, well, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't get the sack production. But there, there's guys that are like Zach. He'll get four, five, six sacks a year in the league. You know, he'll be a good run defender. He's just a world class citizen, great kid. Um, yeah, I wish that Dewan would have followed Zach's lead a little bit more and just Zach just kind of does everything right. He's just a good kid. No, you know, you know, and just a hard worker, but you know, he, he just wasn't productive. Like that's his, his bugaboo is when you're that big and talented, you should be way more productive than you were. But there's a lot of guys that are like that. You know, like, I mean, there's guys that stick around for six, seven, eight years that they get their five, six sacks. They're, they're good. They're good guys or team guys. Um, so Zach's the kind of guy that's going to be like that. I mean, he, he, he's a big athlete. Um, I think he still is pretty raw. He's got a lot of potential. So you know, teams are always, I mean, NFL coaches love them some potential, man. You get that six foot six guy that runs a, a four, six forty and you know, he's 280, 270. Like that's what they crave, you know? Cause they're like, well, let's, let's see if we could unlock what Larry Johnson could and what Ohio state could. Let's see if we can unlock that, that, that freakiness. And, and honestly, I, I think Zach, you know, he just plays too nice. Like he's not a, he's not a nasty dude. I wish he was a little more nasty like JT two Malaz. Um, but you know, I, I think that he's got, upside and, and again like when you're an nfl team like you need you know guys like zach harrison's that are just good solid players great citizens and they're just not you know because you know for you know if you take a turd you need a couple of zach harrison's to kind of even it all out because you can't have a bunch of turds on your team but i think zach's gonna have a nice career i really do um i know he's disappointment to ohio state fans just because of the five-star rating and you know i don't think it was fair that he came after chase young and joey and nick bosa who probably three of the best defensive ends in college football history um top three picks all three of them so that's tough to follow but again i think there's a lot of guys that are like zach that last 10 years in the league and you look up and you're like wow he had a nice career 50 60 sacks you know whatever tackle stop the run and and away you go but i um yeah it's uh it's just interesting the Browns are going to play in the shoe. No, the Browns are going to play in the shoe. I wish they'd play in the shoe. That'd be great. Um, Cam Brown didn't get drafted. I don't know where he signed. I'm sure he signed somewhere. Yeah, like, like Cam Hayward's the guy who's been in the league forever. He was like the 30th pick of the draft, and he's on like, God, he's got to be on year 14 this year. So I mean, he's he's been he's been in for a minute. Um, but yeah, but, but, I, I, but like Kirk, I, to your point, to, to to your point, look at that secondary. You know, you have Cam Brown, Hickman, and McAllister. No, none of them drafted. 
zero yeah. interceptions from the cornerback position Lester. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, people wonder why we're like, why are you defending Knowles? Why are you not? And I'm like, you know, guys, you just have to be realistic. He didn't have a tremendous amount of talent to deal with last year. Those That was not a talented Ohio State defense last year. And, you know, he made, you know, he managed to do some things with the uh, linebacker room. I thought the linebacker room went from, you know, team weakness to team strength in one year. But he did not have talented cornerbacks to deal with. And in, in today's college football, as pass happy as today's college football is, if you don't have elite cornerbacks or at least really good cornerbacks in defensive secondary, you're not going to be very good. And so, you know, we can only expect so much out. You know, we talk about it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmy, Jimmy's and Joe's. He didn't have many Jimmy's and Joe's there in the defensive secondary. And the NFL draft just kind of proved that in, you know, in, in abundance today. So I think that's why one of the reasons we're trying to give people to give Knowles a little bit more slack. Um, now, this year, I think it's a little different. I think he's got he's got some better players to work with. He's got some guys second year in the system, and I think we should expect more. But last year was a was a learning year and, and a year where he didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of ammo to deal with, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that when you've got three guys that are older guys, uh, those weren't guys that declared early. Well, I mean, Ronnie did, but you know, and he was a fourth year guy declared early. Um, and none of them get drafted. I mean, Cam Brown ran like a four seven. Uh, his, his athletic score was 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 terrible. Yeah. So uh, again, like you don't have to say I'm being a beat meanie because the NFL had 260 picks and they didn't pick any of those three guys. So that makes it hard. I mean, again, you need to have big time safeties, big time corners. Um, and we didn't have that. I mean, really, we didn't have a big time defender. You know, I mean, we, we didn't have that that big time player anywhere on defense. I mean, you know, like Tommy had a nice year. Uh, I, I think JT really needs to step his production up. Obviously, he had the massive Penn State game, but if you delete that game from the stat line, like it's not much production for a guy that started all those games and who has all that talent. Uh, Jack Story was completely misused last year. So, again, there's a lot to be desired um, from a production standpoint. Like some of the guys just need to go out and, and play better because, you know, it's not like they're not getting snaps. And, and again, I think our back end, it, it has to be better this year. I think it will be better this year. Uh, I get Davidson, I think is going to push these guys. You know, I think that we're deeper, you know, Sonny Salas has to play. They got to play him somewhere. He's just too good not to play. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be fascinating, but yeah, it's like, you know, the NFL draft is the ultimate litmus test for what the pros think of your guys. And, you know, when you get guys sliding and guys not getting picked, man, it's, it's pretty obvious that they didn't think much of our back end. What do you, uh, in terms of uh, the draft, you know, again, you know, we're at 490 kids drafted or whatever it is. What, uh, you know, what does this do for recruiting Nevada? Does it, I mean, CJ Stroud's now the highest drafted quarterback in Ohio State history. Paris is obviously uh, the highest since Orlando Pace scoring six overall. Does it do anything? Is this a promotional vehicle? Does it get kids more juiced up? Um, seeing these, I mean, because again, we've had three quarterbacks go top 15 you know back to back to back um but what does that do for recruiting in your eyes if you're ohio state and you're ryan day well i mean to me this goes to the core and this is this is a really important distinction for people to understand in the age of nil you've got kind of the nil kids in nil, NIL schools and then the hey we're selling development. We're sen selling future NFL richest schools. And Ohio State is certainly in the latter category. That's what they're selling to kids. They're saying, hey, if you're looking for the best NIL offer, this is probably not the place for you. We'll be able to get you some money. But if you really want to make the big money, that's in the NFL, and that's what we're about. Well, this draft just kind of you know, showed that again in abundance with, a, with another quarterback, with an offensive line, with another in the line of great wide receivers. So for Ohio State, you know, the draft, this couldn't have been better, couldn't have been better at, at a, an important time. And for what Ohio State's selling and how they're trying to sell it, this goes right to the heart of the matter. So this was a, was a great NFL draft for that and certainly something that's going to pay, uh, pay big dividends for them, not only this year, but down the road as well. I think that, you know, it's going to keep the offensive train rolling again, like the defenses again, everyone, for whatever reason, it's like, there's a sect of this Ohio state group of supporters that they wake up every day and they're just scared of the, the, the offensive tackles for whatever reason. I'm like, guys, like we need to find some corners. We need to find some guys that can cover some safety. So it's like, I, I don't worry about the offensive line. Cause I think that it's easier. It's easier to fix and hide on the offensive line. If you've got a guy that maybe is young and you gotta, you gotta protect them a little bit. 
Um, again, I think back to like Taylor Decker in 2013, you know, he had that terrible first game against a guy that's going to be a first ballot hall of famer in all likelihood, uh, in, um, in, in Mac, you know, who was just unbelievably good. A guy from Buffalo who nobody had heard of, I'd heard of him. And I looked at the text to the thing to Urban. I said, Hey, this guy's projected to be a first round pick. I know he was, he plays in the Mac and that usually doesn't happen. So make sure you guys watch tape on this guy. Cause he might, and then I remember watching that game. I was literally sitting in the athletic director's suite. And I was like. This guy's really good. And then all of a sudden, like, he he had the greatest game in, maybe in the history of Ohio Stadium for a defensive player because, I mean, he he had, like, a it was like an interception, a fumble, sack fumble, touchdown. I mean, it was just like – it was like he was like a Madden player or something. But, um, you know, like but when Kirk, you've got a – Go ahead. Kirk, but, but, Kirk, to that point, you're a right tackle. We're talking about the right tackle position specifically. Yeah. How many games this year – or just take any of those guys, take Zen, take George, take Tegra, based upon what you've seen, how many games we get to play this year where they're going to line up against a defensive end that's much better than they are or better than players that they practice against and practice every day? None. I mean, until we get to Georgia and Bama, until we get to the playoffs, none. I'm just telling you, because like we, when, when they go against JT and Jack every day, those guys are to the top five or six DNs. So, you know, there's there's nobody in our league that is markedly better than those guys. Like nobody. So, you know, I don't know. I like for me, I um I, I think that that's the thing that people don't get is like, look, those guys are gonna have 30 practices versus those guys in, in fall camp. Um and, and again, like it's gonna be like it's gonna be heated up. I mean, Ryan Day, you know, he knows that hey, these guys gotta get game ready. Not they're not game ready yet. So you know, there's got a lot of heat on Justin Fries, a lot of heat on, on the GA. You know, I've, I've sat in that seat where, you know, I had to, we had to make Reed Fraggle into a starting right tackle. Reed Fraggle never played tackle in his entire life. He's been a tight end his entire life. So, you know, we had to turn him into a tackle. So he had to learn how to vertical set, pass set, learn the offense. And, you know, so that, that requires 26 hours a day, basically, of, of making sure Reed is up to speed. You, know, you got to find every little bit of time to try to make sure that he's as good as he can be. And it ended up working out. And he and Reed, who'd never played tackle in his life, ended up getting drafted in the seventh round. So, you know, if if you put in enough work, and again, because I've said it a million times, and I love Justin Fry. I mean, he's he's a guy that I've known for a long time. But you know, you don't get paid to coach Paris Johnson and Dewan. You get paid to coach, you know, like the the Zens and some of these other guys, you know, some of these guys that you know, when you walk into Paris Johnson and he's like a cyborg of pass protection, like that's easy. Like my German Shepherd could coach Paris Johnson. Like it's not that hard. He's just a per he's a great kid, real steady kid, super athletic, wants to be great. Like he's got all the attributes, which is why I went six overall. You know, um, you got to coach DeWand a lot because he's a project. He's a kid that didn't even play football sophomore year of high school. So I mean, he's a raw dude. Um, yeah, but most of these guys, you know, you get paid to to coach Reed Fraggle, you know, like a guy that's never played tackle, you got to turn him into a tackle. That's where you earn your money and your respect as a coach is when you have to make these guys play at a level higher than they are accustomed to. So, you know, I, uh, I think, um, but it's going to be interesting. Like I said, it'll, it's a big fall camp. I think it's exciting to see, uh, these guys get after each other and, um, you know, again, I've been in these these battles. Like I was in a battle with Tim Schaefer and TJ Downing, and I initially lost six. I was hurt during spring, um, and then I, you know, I started camp and I was with the twos. And you know, I and again, you just got to keep fighting because again, like by week five, I was the starter. You know, because I started rotating in, I started playing better than Schaefer, and then Schaefer got destroyed in a couple games, and then they just made me the full time starter because I was actually grading out higher than he was. So, you know, again, I, I I tell these guys that aren't starting, I'm like, look, guys, you're one ACL away from being the guy. And, you know, if you're in a competition, like the competition doesn't end, you know, it's not like it's a race where they, they, you run through the tape and after the, you run through the tape, it's over. Like the, the competition goes all season at these positions. So if Zen is the day one starter at right tackle, if I'm Tigra, man, I'm living in the Woody Hayes, working out three times a day, getting treatment, you know, just going crazy to try to figure out how I can take that job from him so I can perform better. So, I don't know, but that's that's kind of what it takes to be a starter at Ohio State. And and if you are the starter, you better be putting in more work than the guy who's trying to take your spot. Because you, know, you when you're the starter, man, everyone behind you wants to take your spot. That's what they came here for. They didn't come here to sit there and watch you play. So, um, but that's my sermon. But yeah, I I um 
I don't know. I, I really like that. Uh, that yeah, you know, we've got competition. I think you know, if we get the kid from San Diego State, I'm, I mean, I'd welcome him. I don't think he's a superstar by any stretch, but I think he's got some tools. And if he likes Justin Fry, that's great. But you know, I, I don't think he's a cinch. You know, move everybody out of the first spot and, and lock him in there. I think he's a guy that'd be added to the competition, and and I I would welcome that because I think you need more competition, and competition is never a bad thing, especially as summer conditioning starts because. Everybody wants to beat everything who's competing with everybody. So I think it's going to be some good stuff. Well, Nevada, we've had, whew, God, that's almost an hour. Jeez. Um, what other, uh, what other thoughts do you have? Uh, I'm going to save the line back for tomorrow. We're going to break down, uh, Kingston via Malu Asa from St. John Bosco. I think that we should call this Bosco scoops as we seem to break down a guy from Bosco every week now. Uh, but he's a guy that loves James Laurinaitis, uh, he announced his final three is USC, us, and Notre Dame. Um, I think we got a shot here, but you know, mom likes Notre Dame, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that goes. So we're going to break him down tomorrow. But uh, uh, any questions in the chat, guys? Fire these questions up. Shout out where you guys are from, too. Yeah, Sean Wade is. I think he's still a Patriot. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts about it? Like I said, this is a loaded weekend. I wasn't planning on doing a bunch of recruiting stuff tonight, but hey, it's what happens when you're on the scoop. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's the, 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 the tackle from San Diego State's kind of the interesting one for me because, you know, uh, we took the transfer from Louisiana Tech, Cutler, and, you know, he's not ready for prime time yet, you know. And so mm-hmm. I'm a little, you know, I, I'm not sure how many times you can do that and have it be a good thing for your team. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like if, if you, I, I don't think you can do that multiple times. So I, I hope that he's better than that because that first one didn't work out so well. And, you know, you, you people just think it's not, it's, you know, it's not just that you bring a guy in, you bring a guy in that, it, that chips away a little bit away from the uh, kind of the cohesiveness and the, the whole you know, the brotherhood and everything. Cause you're bringing this guy in the kind of people say, Oh, they do that all the time, but recruiting is kind of different than bringing in transfers. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm all for transfers as long as they can play. So yeah. just, you know, don't do it if, if it's not somebody who's not going to be a Jonah Jackson or a Trey Sermon or a Justin Fields. Don't, you know, don't just do it to do it because I think that can destroy your culture and I think that can create problems for you. So I, I'm just, I, I truly hope, like, I think he's, from what I see, he looks like a depth piece and a guy that, that you know, could be in the mix. And like I said, if he jumps in and he grabs the job, that's just great for all of us. So great. I think we'll know a lot more about that in the next 24 hours, whether or not he's going to be a Buckeye. Um, we'll see what he's about. And like you said, having Paris Johnson taken as high as he was certainly, you know, is, is attractive to any offensive lineman. And Justin does have a pre-existing relationship. So uh, that may, that might be good enough to carry the day. Yeah. So here's some Utah film again. Like I, I like, I, I, I like the movement, you know, again, here's Utah's probably the best team on this film, but you know, I don't know. Like, 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 I mean, it's, I think he's okay. Like I said, I don't think, obviously he's not, he's not a world beater, but you know, he's a guy that would be in the competition, but he's not a guy that you just give the job to, in my opinion. And I've watched a lot of off of the line tape. And again, it's nice to actually be able to watch some college tape instead of it being all, you know, high school stuff, you know, old high school stuff. But he's a, uh, you know, like I said, he's got some tools. I think he's got to get stronger, obviously, because he doesn't look he doesn't have like a, a super muscular physique. Like you look at photos of his little doughy, but I think he's got a chance. And and again, but you know, would it hurt to have some depth? Yeah, of course. I mean, we just had Ben Ben Christman just walked out the door. So you you lose three in the draft and then you lose one in the portal. I mean, you gotta you gotta bring in a, a transfer guy. Like that's the thing that people they say, oh, we're we're short in recruiting. I'm like, well, yeah, when you have four guys declare early in two years, you're gonna be short. When you have you know guys portal out like Ryan Jacoby, Max Ray, Ben Chrisman, you're going to be short. That's just, this is math, guys. It's not that hard. So, um, you know, I think this is going to end up being a six zero line class. You know, hopefully we'll get a couple of these these national guys that we're we're all over. Um, but yeah, like I said, this this kid's got he's got some movement skills. Um, you know, my biggest question is why does he play left tackle? You know, if he if he's you know such a a good tackle, his feet are so good. Like why does he play on the left side? So. And again, that's not a that's not a knock. I just you know they might have a, a four year start at left tackle. I just don't know about it. But you know, I just want to throw some film on here because I've watched them and you know I, I like I said I think that the movement skills are they're there they're they're good. But 
you know, he's he's blocking. He's not blocking JT two in a while in these in these one on one pass rush clips. He's blocking guys from San Diego State that, frankly, I played San Diego State. And it's kind of like a it's kind of a joke, you know. So it's it's a different level. Um, you see him lock down these guys, but these guys would never likely play at Ohio State, or they'd be deep backups. So, you know, they're they're basically kind of like a MAC team. So, uh, there's nothing wrong, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the same as blocking JT and Jack every day. Um, but uh, like I said, it'll be interesting to see if we get them. I, again, I, I always am kind of wary of the West Coast kids because you know I always feel like if SC comes through, that's where they dream of going to. You know, he's from. He's from Helix, which is where Alex Smith and Reggie Bush are from. Um, you know, so those kids that, that are from Helix, they don't dream of being Buckeyes. They dream of being uh, Trojans. So, but again, we'll see. You know, again, I, I'd take the kid, but he's not good enough to just push everybody out of out of the way and, and make him the guy. Uh, I'll see if we got any other questions. Who represents Jones and Whipler? Jones is with Clutch Sports. That's LeBron's group. Whipler, I'm not sure. Um, like I said with Dewan, I just I just don't know who was advising him because I'd have told him, dude, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not trying to whatever, but I mean he could have done a lot of stuff a lot better through the process. But he's got a home now, his fourth round pick of the Browns. But I mean, I, I just think that he he could have been a, a first round pick if he did the process correctly. Um does Hartline's recent issues take away potential responsibility that he may or um Nevada, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think so. Um, because it, it's kind of just gone away and swept under the rug but what are your thoughts on that no no yeah. i mean that, that again ohio state just wants that whole issue to go away they don't want to talk about it anymore they don't want to hear about it anymore and um you know as we've mentioned before for brian hopefully this, this is a wake-up call to kind of you know realize you can't be involved in that type of shenanigans anymore and um especially if you want to be a, a head coach you know that uh like you can get away with it now because you're a, you know, kind of you're the, still the position coach. You haven't been the offensive coordinator. You're, you're not as high profile. Can you imagine if that was Ryan Day doing that? Um, mm -hmm. That'd be a real problem. So, uh, you know, hopefully it's a wake up call. Hopefully it's uh, sometimes these things happen and it's uh, it's the best for all involved. And I, I'm hoping that's uh, the outcome for Brian. Yeah. Um, anyone worried about McCord? I, I don't. I don't know if worried is the right word. I just. You know, anytime you have a new quarterback in the mix, you, you know you gotta you gotta go out and prove you can play. I mean, I've, I've been a part of new quarterbacks that are seamless, and I've been out a part of new quarterbacks that uh, the backups were better than, like clearly better than. And then you just hope that the coaching staff is smart enough to put the backup in, um, and then they become, you know, then we we take flight. You know, but sometimes the coaches don't even start the right guy. So I think Devin Brown is is a really good player. I think he's a fantastic athlete. And I think it's going to be a, a fierce competition. I would be shocked if he starts game one um, just because of, you know, I, I think that, you know, Kyle would be in the portal before, you know, halftime. But uh, your thoughts on McCord, Nevada, after after spring as we get into summer? Well, I just think what people should do is go back and watch tape of Justin Fields in the spring game or go back last year and watch tape of C.J. Stroud in the spring game and watch those guys and, and see if anything about their play screamed franchise quarterback for the Bears or second overall pick. I mean, the spring game is just it's it's I mean Fields could not have looked worse. He couldn't have he couldn't have looked worse. He was he was horrible. Absolutely and CJ was just a guy last year, like really, 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 really average in the spring game. So I just don't think people, you know, I, you know, I have some concerns, but my concerns are only based on the fact that we just don't have enough to see because I don't think Ryan Day played at McCord enough in backup duty, and I think that goes for all the backups. I've said that. I've said that before. I've said it loudly. I think that, you know, for whatever reason, whether it was stat padding or whatever, whatever they're trying to do, I don't think they got the backups enough snaps. And um, so I think that we've, did, you know, I've, I've got questions about McCord just because we haven't seen enough of him to answer those questions. But don't base stuff, don't base questions about McCord, don't base questions about the tackles, anything on the spring game, because the spring game is just designed to make certain people look bad. And uh, offensive tackles and quarterbacks can look really bad. And, and, and it, if you just need proof of that, like I said, go back and watch. The, you know, I think Jack Sawyer had three or four sacks last year in the spring game and then had, what, four sacks for the whole year? Well, yeah. So, like, don't don't draw too many conclusions 
off of the spring game because uh, you, you can get misled very, very easily. The Solomon Thomas had seven sacks in the spring game the one year. Seven. Like Derek Thomas, yeah. like seven sacks. And like, I don't know if he had one in his career. I mean, Solomon, he had, obviously had the pick against Arkansas, but like Solomon was, it was just a guy. I mean, he was just a guy, a nice kid, but he was just a guy. He was never a guy that anyone was scared of in the past. Rush. But in, the, in a spring game, he had seven sacks. So again, that, it just proves how, I guess worthless it is. It's kind of like judging, you know, if you pick your fantasy team off who are the best players in preseason NFL football, you're like, oh, this running back from the Eagles that played in the fourth quarter had an 80 yard touchdown and, you know, 50 more yards. And I'm going to take him in the first round because he's, you know, some fifth string guy that's playing playing out the string of the end of the preseason. So again, I I I don't worry about it just because, you know, I know that our offense, I mean, I literally talked to the coaches at Ohio State after the game. Um, and, and they're literally like, they hate the spring game. It's for the fans. It's an exhibition, but they hate it because they can't, it's like they're, they're handcuffed. They can't call their defense. They can't call their offense. And it's just like this big mash of just vanilla pudding, you know? And like those coaches just can't stand it. They can't adjust. They can't make substitutions. They're running. They don't have their best players. So, you know, if you're the play caller and you don't have, okay, Marvin gets to play four plays and Mecca's not playing and Trey's not playing and Mayan's not playing and Josh Ferris playing one drive. And, you know, like it just, it sucks, you know, because then you got to try to to mix it up with a bunch of guys that probably aren't going to be playing much. So, um, again, I think it's uh, it's funny. And again, I went to the 2002 spring game um, after the, the, the immortal seven and five season that Trestle opened up his tenure with. And the final score was six to three and they played a full game and it was six to three. So, and then they go on to win the national champ. They go 14 and oh, probably had the greatest season in Ohio state history, beat the Miami hurricanes. So again, it was six to three at the spring game. It was the most boring football game I literally have ever seen in my life. And you know, it turned into the greatest season in Ohio state history. So, um, just for you guys that are late, we got Jordan Lyle. He's a four-star running back out of St. Thomas Aquinas. He committed, um, and Lorenzo Salas Jr. has formally committed. We had that last week. Obviously, we had that first, like usual. Um, but it was uh, really a great night for the Bucks. I thought we were going to get on talk draft, and it turned into a big recruiting episode. So, uh, But we're going to wrap this. Nevada, you got any final thoughts as we, uh, we lock down NFL draft weekend and a couple of nice commitments? Yeah, I don't think we're done with commitments. I think uh, stay tuned on commitments. And as I led this thing off, um, our, our Buckeye Scoop betting thread has been on fire. Hit another huge hammer bet tonight. Uh, if you're on the, the, the thread, you know what I'm talking about. But that is literally we're giving away free money right now. So if you're not taking advantage of that, do take advantage of that. Sports gambling is legal in the state of Ohio right now. So you can do it from the comfort of your own home and you can pay for your annual subscription in one bet. So uh, it's uh, it's pretty exciting because this was a good one. This was not only did we hit the uh, the, the win prop, but we hit the, the prop on the, the the fight to go to decision. So big night, big night for Dagestan Poppy, big night for Buckeye Scoop. Yeah, that's that's something like people don't realize. Like obviously, you know, we've got the inside goods for Ohio State football, but our gambling thread is an ATM machine. It's been awesome. So if you guys are into that at all, if you guys are in DraftKings or any of that, you can tell our tell these bets. We've got really really sophisticated handicappers doing their thing right now and and you can look at their their monthly uh you know what, what they've been doing like this, this is tracked action this isn't just some random thing that pops up like the last 13 months have just been absolute craziness so uh, if you guys are into gambling buckeyescoop.com your new home uh any final thoughts about it nope just stay tuned for some more commitment because i think we uh, i have a sneaking suspicion one may be uh breaking pretty shortly mm, i love that um I'll take this last question because I like this one. Lauren Edison sells junior help against Notre Dame. I think a little bit. I think James will know the defense. Um, I'm sure the signals will all be different, but uh, it never hurts personnel wise to have a guy like James come over because he knows the offensive and defensive players who to attack. Um, obviously sells juniors. He'll know the, the defense, but again, they'll, they'll have different signals. So um, I'd say it'd be minor, but you know, I'm sure that if I was Ryan Dad make James the head coach of the Notre Dame game, because Urban used to do that. He used to assign each game to a different position coach. And like Luke Fickle would be the head coach of the Wisconsin game. Ed Warner would be the head coach of the Cal game. And and you have to give kind of the presentation in the summer of this is what Cal does. This is who they are. 
Um, and you usually do like the first four to six games. You don't do all of them. Uh, you do Michigan obviously every year, but you know, cause by week six, I mean, teams can be completely different. So you don't want to waste too much time in the summer, but uh, I think that that's a, a fantastic question. And I appreciate that again, your questions really help the show. We really appreciate that. Thank you guys for bringing the heat on the questions. So uh, I think we're good to that. Are you good? I'm good. Great night. Right. We'll talk to you. Talk to you soon. All right, brother. Let's wrap this show up. Appreciate you guys. As always, you guys, uh, again, this has been a fantastic show. Great night for the Buckeyes. Two new commits, uh, Lorenzo Sells Jr., Jordan Lyle out of St. Thomas Aquinas, four-star running back. So huge night. Um, again, if you guys are gamblers, our gambling thread is crazy. I don't promote it enough, I don't think, but it's it's awesome, and we are on fire. But um, there's going to be some more commitments coming, so get on BuckeyeScript.com. about to log in, uh, do another article on the draft. I wrote a really big article about – what I thought about Paris, what I thought about CJ, the landing spots. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to do a little bit on, on Dewan, a little bit on Luke, and uh, just kind of give my two cents. But Bill Bank Green's been all over the board today. Nevada, uh, breaking inside stuff. It's been a great day on BuckeyeScoop.com. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for your awesome questions. Shout out where you guys are from. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. And again, I know people get upset when they don't know what time the show comes on because sometimes it's different based on our schedules, but get that little alert button. There's a little bell. You click on it. You get a notification when we go live. So you guys can always ask us questions, always get the good stuff. So appreciate you guys. I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Thank you guys. If you guys want some more goods, get on BuckeyeScoop.com. I'm heading on there now. Going to be on there all night. Um, great night of, of hockey and some great uh, sports going on. So uh, we're going to be going all night on the scoop, talking uh, draft recaps, new recruiting stuff. Uh, these, these visits are wrapping up. So, it's going to be a good night on Scoop. So thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. Thank you, Scoop family. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Go Bucks.